Well, Wolf, uh, I was able to uh, pull aside here just for a few moments. Uh, Dr. Robert Jeffress, he is the uh, pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas. He also gave a speech introducing Governor Rick Perry earlier this afternoon. And, and if you don't mind me saying, uh, Pastor Jeffress, you created a bit of a stir coming out of that speech because uh, in talking to reporters, you said in pretty strong, plain language, what you think of Mormonism, you described it as a cult. And you said that if a Republican votes for Mitt Romney, they're giving some credibility to a cult. Do you stand by that comment? Oh, absolutely. And that's not some fanatical comment. That's been the historic uh, position of evangelical Christianity. The Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest Protestant denomination in the world, has officially labeled Mormonism as a cult. When a frontrunner for the Republican nomination for president gets caught in a fundamentalist bigotry eddy like this, the expressed understanding in the Beltway media is not that there's been any real display of religious bigotry in the Republican Party or among the conservative movement, but rather that mainstream Republicans like Mitt Romney and like Speaker of the House John Boehner and Majority Leader Eric Cantor, these guys have just had an unfortunate brush up against the very fringy far right extreme, not representative part of the American conservative movement, which the presumed mainstreamers just make a big show of being nice to, even though we all know they have no real influence in what they think doesn't really mean anything. That's your basic Beltway Media, narr- uh, Beltway media narrative uh, about something like this weekend's Values Voter Summit. Here's what's missing from that analysis. The Values Voter thing is not a fringe event. If it ever was, it isn't anymore. I mean, substantively, of course, it's a fringe event. It's like the flatter society. But it's not fringe within the conservative movement and Republican Party politics. Mitt Romney has gone to the Values Voter Summit for six years in a row now. Every major Republican presidential candidate except for John Huntsman, is he still considered major, uh, spoke at the Values Voter Summit this weekend. And it's not just the candidates looking for votes. It's also the House Republican leadership, the congressional leadership of the Republican Party, which supposedly represents the mainstream of the party and should not be tarred by the extreme views of the fringe of the conservative movement. But here's House Majority Leader Eric Cantor speaking at the Values Voter Summit. Here's Speaker of the House John Boehner speaking at the Values Voter Summit. Here's who they shared the stage with at the Values Voter Summit. I believe we need a president who understands that just as Islam represents the greatest long-range threat to our liberty, so the homosexual agenda represents the greatest immediate threat to every freedom. Woo! Woo! When all the Republican presidential candidates and the Republican congressional leadership do big national televised events like this, why is there this gentleman's understanding, right, with the Beltway media, that Republicans who speak at these things shouldn't be seen as sharing that event's agenda? They know what they're getting into. Why do we all make excuses for them on things like this? I mean, in the weeks leading up to the number one and number two Republicans in the House speaking at this Values Voter Summit thing, look how they behaved. Republicans in the House announced they would move forward with yet another effort to eliminate all insurance coverage for abortion anywhere in the country. They tried to do this during the health reform debate. They tried to hijack health reform to effectively ban abortion for women who could not afford it without insurance. And since they didn't get what they wanted, didn't at least get enough of what they wanted at that time, Republicans in the House have started going after that again. They have also started a new witch hunt going after Planned Parenthood, demanding documentation from Planned Parenthoods nationwide going back 20 years, documentation of patient referrals, of funding, and what they called improper billing. With the big values voter speech on his calendar, Speaker of the House John Boehner just announced plans to triple the amount of money the House is spending to defend the anti-gay Clinton-era Defense of Marriage Act in court. Thanks to John Boehner, you, the taxpayer, have a $500 an hour lawyer making that case on your behalf to hold on to the Defense of Marriage Act. His expenses were not supposed to exceed a half million dollars, this lawyer, but he's now cleared for a million and a half of your dollars. And if the point isn't clear enough, the House Republican chairman of the Armed Services Committee told C-SPAN on Friday that he will block all funding for the Pentagon unless it also comes with a new anti-gay marriage law. The Pentagon will not be funded now, according to House Republicans, unless they get their way against gay marriage. Is this issue for you worth not having a defense authorization bill? Yes. Yes. 
no matter how much Republicans prioritize abortion at the state level and at the federal level again and again and again, no matter how much Republicans prioritize gay rights at the state level and at the federal level again and again and again, no matter how much Republicans get their Jerry Falwell on and focus again and again on these social issues, on these rights issues, the Beltway media insists they are focused like a laser on jobs, jobs, jobs. Oh, and also on jobs and also jobs. I do not know why the Beltway media excuses what the Republicans are doing in favor of the Republicans' favored mainstream narrative about what they are doing. Why don't we look at what they do instead of what, they, what, what they're saying they do? I realize I'm aiming too high. Let me close with one case study. Presidential candidate Mitt Romney told former presidential candidate Mike Huckabee on Fox News recently that he, Mitt Romney, would support an amendment, a constitutional amendment to define life as beginning at conception. Mitt Romney said yes, he would support such a constitutional amendment. Look, I can prove it to you. Watch. Would you have support of the constitutional amendment that would have established the definition of life at conception? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a personhood amendment that Huckabee is talking about. Personhood amendments are broadly understood uh, not just to ban abortion outright, but also to ban many common forms of birth control, including the pill. That's what their proponents intend, and it is seen as a likely impact of this thing that Mitt Romney just said he supports. Wow. The Republican frontrunner for the presidential nomination wants to ban the pill. I have a follow-up question. I mean, not a single Beltway reporter has asked him a follow-up question about this as to whether or not he really understood what he was saying yes to. Did you really mean it, sir? You really want to ban the pill, Mitt Romney? Can you explain? Can somebody please ask Mitt Romney a follow-up question on that? Or do we believe him that he's just laser-focused on jobs, jobs, jobs? We here at The Rachel Maddow Show cannot get a call back from the Romney campaign when we have asked him the follow-up question. Can somebody who can get Mitt Romney's people on the phone please ask him that? He could be like mid-pancake flip in New Hampshire. Just ask him. Anyone, please? Joining us now is Melissa Harris-Perry, professor of political science at Tulane University and an MSNBC contributor. Uh, Melissa, thanks for your time tonight. Absolutely. Is there as much of a disconnect as I am frustrated about (laughs) between how much Republicans really are focusing on social issues and the coverage of them as if they are not focused on social issues at all? Well, for, for me, the most frustrating part is the disconnect between the extent to which um, the Republican potential nominees for the GOP presidential you know, uh, run here are focused on social issues when the polling tells us that ordinary Americans are fundamentally focused on issues of the economy. Sometimes the deficit shows up, unemployment. Every once in a while, you'll get a blip, for example, post 9-11 around questions of national security and terrorism. I mean, you know, I, I think we could make lots of claims about how our media, whether it's Beltway media or, you know, supposedly ideological media or Twitter or any of our media sources are sort of focused on a variety of different ways of thinking about the political arena. But the big disconnect is between what people are identifying as the major problems facing America at this moment and what these candidates are talking about and the basis on which they're being chosen as front runners. The, the issue internally within the Republican Party used to be how much mainstream Republicans could sort of flirt with the fringier elements of the social conservative movement, the evangelical movement, not part of the conservative movement, while still maintaining general election electability. Sure. That, um, having to walk that line it becomes a lot easier if they are not reported as doing that flirting. <laughs> and, yeah. so, and so as we see the real, fr- I mean, the Brian Fishers of the world, the real fringe of that movement essentially become mainstream figures in Republican politics. Is there not a cost to be paid for that in the long run? There is. You know, interestingly enough, that, that transition of um, a relatively well-organized but undoubtedly small minority within a kind of big party like the GOP is suddenly becoming central to deciding who the Republicans will actually put up as a presidential candidate, someone who's going to have to 
appeal across a broad range. That's actually exactly what much of the American left has been trying to figure out how to do in the Democratic Party, right? How do we get sort of a, a set of questions or issues on the agenda that could be hammered home over and over again to Democratic presidential candidates in a way that would force them to have this sort of progressive agenda at the same time that they were running for president of the United States? And, and the fact is that much of the left has been unable to do that. But on the right, over the course of the past 25 years, they've been incredibly effective at moving to the center of that party and particularly to the center of the nominating process. So that over and over again, even in, you know, supposedly mainstream debates, not just at these values voter summits, we hear them answering questions about just how much are you willing to restrict reproductive rights? Just how just how pro-life are you? It's no longer even a question of whether or not choice is even on is even a possibility for a Republican candidate, for example. Melissa Harris-Perry, Tulane politics professor and MSNBC contributor. Melissa, thank you for helping Thanks. us understand this. I appreciate Absolutely. it. You may remember uh, former Florida Congressman Alan Grayson from appearances like this on the floor of the House of Representatives. Here it is. The Republicans' health care plan for America. Don't get sick. That's right. Don't get sick. If you have insurance, don't get sick. If you don't have insurance, don't get sick. If you're sick, don't get sick. Just don't get sick. Alan Grayson is not Congressman Alan Grayson anymore, but his words about the Occupy Wall Street protests have been clear and pointed and, from what I hear from a lot of people, motivating. Alan Grayson is our guest tonight on the subject of the growing movement and the right wing's tin ear for it. Stay tuned. <laughs> 